Cool. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? You excited to be here? I'm excited to be here. So um, I'm originally from New York City. Uh, this is my uh, third time in Lisbon. Um, I love this city, so I keep coming back to it. It's pretty amazing. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you this morning about what I'm really passionate about, which is how do we set up organizations to be thriving at product management? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this scary trap that we get into called the build trap. And how do we get out of it by building organizations that really thrive off product management? So let's go back a little bit. So when I first started as a product manager, I really had no idea what it was. I was told that my job was to go work with sales in the business, figure out what the requirements for the product should be, spec them all up in these beautiful documents, and then hand them off to the engineers. And the more detailed, the better, right? Because then I didn't actually have to talk to them. So the thing was, I was really, really good at this. I was really good at specifying documents. Actually, this is one of the first ones I ever wrote, and it was 21 pages long for a change password page. <laughs> so, and I was told by my boss at the time that I was awesome, right? I was the best product manager. I made the most detailed specs. I made the best designs for it, and nobody ever had to talk to me or clarify anything, because it was all down on the page. So I thought, I got this, right? I'm a great product manager. This is what I'm going to do with my life. I, I'm really thriving here. So eventually, I left that company, and I went to another one. And when I got there, I was told, do the same thing, right? Go out, make the specifications, figure out what we should build, hand them off to the developers. So I started working in that way again. And I made these beautiful documents. I shipped them off to our development team. I was in New York. They were in Nashville. And I waited. And three weeks later, I got back the designs in the, sorry, the fully developed product, right, from them to test. And I looked at it and I said, mm, this is not what I specified at all. Like, guys, didn't you read the documents? Like, I put everything here. It's right here in all these 30 pages. And they went, that thing? Oh, yeah, I didn't read that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> or like, it was 30 pages long. You think I was going to actually read that? No, I like skimmed it and then I just built stuff. And now I'm starting to have a crisis because I'm going, all right, if, if this is not working, right, if my developers are not building what I'm asking them to do, what am I, right? What is my purpose in life? What does product management really mean? How do I do this? And at that time, too, we were trying to figure out how to work better together as a company. Like, obviously, my developers were not happy with me. They were like, I'm not going to read anything you say. I don't trust you. And we were really frustrated as well. So, now, our company is trying to figure out, what do we do? How do we get people to work better together? So I was told that, let's burn all your specs, because we're going agile. And we're going to do this new thing, and it's going to help you work better together, and you're going to be faster, and it will help collaboration. And at the time, though, I didn't know what agile was, right? I wasn't sure what the difference between this and waterfall was. And because we were so frustrated between me and my developers and our whole team, right, I said, you know what? Anything will work. Let's just make this better. Let's, let's all work better together, and I'll be happy. So we started implementing Scrum, right? And we had very basic um, Scrum fundamentals that we were using. And it was very lightweight. We had an agile coach on our team who was also a developer, and he just introduced it piece by piece. You know, manage the backlog, talk about what you're going to do, break it up into work. And it actually worked really, really well for us. We started collaborating better. I started talking to my developers instead of specifying everything in documents. And we ended up being a really, really great team. We were the most productive team in the company. We were really shipping things out. And everybody was like, look at that team. That's the model of success right there. So I thought we were doing really, really well until we got onto one project. There was a project that we started working on, and we were trying to make um, dashboards for these uh, sellers that we had. So we were an e-commerce company that had two sides. We had celebrity sellers who would pick out um, all their favorite products and things like home and healthy living and uh, design, and they would sell it through our platform. So we would source it, we would get all those things for them, they would advertise it, and then people could come on our platform and buy it. So I was in charge of making this whole portal so that the sellers could come on and see how their businesses were doing. What were they selling? What was the most popular products? What were people saying? Sounds reasonable, right? And I got to work, 
And I did all the standard product management things you do. So I went out, I talked to 12 of our um, sellers, I figured out all the requirements that they wanted to see, everything that they could possibly want. And I designed this like multi-page portal where they could get all of their business information and all of their um, comments and everything. So we spent three months building this thing and we put it out there. And I felt pretty good about it. I was like, look, this is everything you wanted. I put in all of the things that you asked for. Look at how beautiful this is. Isn't this a wonderful portal for you? And at that time, we started to use um, analytics tools for the first time ever. We had never done that before. So I had Google Analytics installed on the page, and I was really excited to watch those numbers go up. So every day I would log in, and I would watch for the numbers. And there was no numbers. And so I'd log in the next day. I was like, no, 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 they'll come back tomorrow. And there's no numbers. And I log in the next day, and this keeps going on, right, for weeks after weeks. And I find that nobody's coming, nobody's using this product. So I ask them, I'm like, I built you everything you wanted, right? You told me these were all the things you wanted to see. Why aren't you logging in? And they went, what is all this shit? It's so complicated. I know, like I told you I wanted to see revenue, but all I really need to see is profit. Like I don't care about 90% of the stuff you shoved into this platform. And again, now I'm starting to have a crisis going, okay, if I built them everything they asked for, right, what is my job as a product manager? And I realized at this time that I was stuck in something that I call the build trap, right? And the build trap is a pretty common place for a lot of companies where we keep building and building and we keep collecting all these requirements and we keep trying to figure out how we can build the world, right? But we never actually focus on what that does for our customers. What kind of value do we actually provide for them? And are we building the right thing? So, many companies are stuck in the build trap today, but how did we actually get here, right? How do we all get stuck in this build trap and end up in a place where we cared more about the things we produce rather than the value it creates? Well, fundamentally, I think there's a big misconception in companies about what value actually means, right? We, value is a hard thing to measure, and if you were in my workshop yesterday, this is what we all talked about. Um, value is a really, really hard thing to measure. So instead of measuring actual value, what we do is we place proxies there. We, do th we measure things that are easy, which are outputs, right? So companies think that the more specifications we do or the more stories we write, the faster we code, right? Like, let's just make people's fingers go faster, the more money we make. But this is not a linear equation whatsoever, right? This is not a real equation. So what happens, though, is because we think this way, we keep adding and adding to these backlogs, and we produce massive lists of requirements and stories, and then our products become a hodgepodge of complexity, right? When was the last time anybody knew how to use one of these printers? Like, I can't get this thing to work for my life, right? Somebody was like, great, printers work, fine, but let's put a stapler in it, right? Like, let's put a fax machine. Let's make it do everything. And now no one knows how to use it. So this is still relevant from 1999. So we're making these really complex, really, um, really overblown products, right? And a lot of people think Agile is to blame, right? Because we go, oh, Agile is all about velocity and story points. What do we do there? And I thought it was really interesting. I was at um, the Mind the Product conference a couple of years ago. Anybody attend that conference before? Great. Um, it's, uh, and I was sitting next to Jeff Patton. And we had one of the speakers who was the CEO of Drift, a company in Boston, get up there and he was talking. And he says, oh, I'm not even gonna get into Agile. And like the whole room just like starts snickering. They're like, <laughs> and he goes, oh, okay. I will get into Agile. Oh, I hate Agile. It's all points and velocity. Nobody talks about the customer. And 2,000 product managers stood up and applauded. And we were like, uh-oh something's wrong here, right? Fundamentally, something's wrong with Agile if all these product managers hate it, right? And for me, I didn't quite get that because when I, like I said, when I started using Scrum and those techniques, it helped me work better as a product manager. It helped me work better with my team. But what I think happens with companies is that they think that Agile is gonna save the world, right? They're looking for silver bullets to fix everything. 
And what they don't realize is that Scrum doesn't have a brain, right? When you do Agile or you do Scrum, it's not about what are the best products we could possibly build. It's about how do we work better together to build them. So we still need great product management foundations in order to be successful there. So whether you are, and one of the biggest debates, right, coming out of Scrum is what's the difference between a product owner and a product manager? And this one drives me nuts. Because if you take Scrum away, right, if you take the motions of Scrum away, where you're managing the backlog and doing all those meetings, you should still be a product manager at the end of the day, right? Product owner is a role that you play on a Scrum team. It is only one piece of the job. Product management, product managers, that's your job, right? That's your career, and that's what you set out to be. So managing the backlog, doing those meetings, that's just one piece of what you do. But you still have to figure out, what are we building, right? What is the best thing I could possibly build that creates value for both my business and my customers? And that's what we have to get back to. So I try to explain to everybody that as a system, as a company, right, our job is to maximize value. And the way that I explain how the system works is that we have customers on one side and we have businesses on the other. And customers have problems, wants, and needs that we can fulfill with products and services, right? But it's not until we actually take away those problems and fulfill those wants and needs that the customer realizes value. There is no inherent value in a feature that you ship until it solves a problem, until it fulfills a want or a need. And that is when the customers realize value. And in return, they give us value in exchange in the form of money or data or whatever it is that your company runs on, and that's how we get business value. So as product managers, right, our job is to figure out what products and services really maximize those two things, the customer value and the business value. That's our job, is to optimize this system and figure out how we can produce the most value on these things. And what we have to remember is that solving big problems, right, creates big value for our businesses. That's what we really have to focus on. So at the end of the day, if we want to make value for our businesses, we solve the problems for our users. So to get out of the build trap, right, we have to create a product management organization that really thrives on this, that really helps maximize these two things. And to do that, you need a lot of pieces. You have to first start with strategy, right? We have to align ourselves with a strategy that really optimizes for value, that helps communicate up and down what we're actually building. We have to look at our processes and optimize that to figure out what is the best product we can build. And we have to create an organization that really supports that through its culture and through its structure. So let's first start with strategy. How do we create great strategies that really enable product management? Well, I want to tell you a little bit of a story of a company that I worked with several years ago. It was a meal kit delivery service. So what they did is that they shipped boxes to people's homes, and those boxes had all the ingredients and the recipes for the food that they wanted to deliver. So you would get the box, you'd pull out all the ingredients, everything was there, you cook a very nice dinner. It was great. So I came in to help this team, and they had a very clear goal. It was to double acquisition. It was like, we need a double acquisition by the end of the year. And I said, great. And I started coaching them around how do we actually figure out how to get to those acquisition goals. And we were in a meeting with um, our team and trying to plan our next experiment. And the CTO walks in, and he sits down, and he's just kind of chilling there for a little bit, and I'm going, why are you in here? Um, and he chimes in in the middle of my sentence and goes, no, 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 no. Like, all oh, this is great, but like, what is your product strategy? What are you building? And I tried to explain to him. I said, we don't know what problem we're solving yet. Like, we don't know why people aren't signing up. We've done an analysis. We're trying to figure out how to get in touch with them. And he goes, no, 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 no. This is fine, but I want to document with every field you intend to put on the home page, everything you're going to build so that I can go build a content management system, and I need that by Friday. So like, go spec out everything you're going to build. And I'm going, that's not a strategy, right? This is a wish list, and I can't tell you what we should build yet because we haven't figured it out. But most companies believe this, right? They think most product strategies are wish lists of features. It's like, OK, let's just build all these things, and that's our strategy. And then what we do is we take all those features and then we put them in a Gantt chart, which is just a lie, right? Because nobody's going to deliver these things on time. So that becomes our roadmap. 
And then we just lie to ourselves and try to actually complete these things. So the thing that we fail to recognize with this, right, is that creating products is absolutely full of uncertainty, right? When we start out building something, when we start out really exploring something, we don't know what's the right direction to go in very often. And we have to take the time to do that research, to do that analysis, to talk to our customers, to experiment, to really understand that. So product strategy needs to enable it. And you can't do that if it's a plan. So product strategy is not a plan. It has to be more of a framework. And I think the best definition I've ever seen of what strategy is, is by a guy named Stephen Bungay. So Stephen Bungay wrote the book called Art of Action. And if you haven't read it, totally suggest you do. It's really good. And what he says is that strategy is a deployable decision-making framework enabling action to achieve desired outcomes constrained by current capabilities and coherently aligned to the existing context. So what he's saying here is that strategy is a framework, right? Strategy is a framework that allows you to figure out where am I now and where do I want to go and how do I connect those things? And how do I give people the room to actually explore how we actually get there? So in product management, um, we use with our clients uh, this kind of template to really set them up through product strategy. So what we do is we start with the vision. So what's the vision of the company, right? What's the vision of where you want to go? And then we break it down and say, okay, how do you need to get there? What's the most important thing you need to do to get there? So we call these challenges. What business challenges are standing in our way? And then we break them into the product goals and initiatives, right? What things can we build with product or what problems can we tackle with product to actually solve that? So when that CTO asked us, what is your product strategy, right? We needed to reply with um, something that actually allowed us to explore. So if we think about this meal kit delivery company, right? Their vision was that they wanted to be the most convenient meal kit delivery on the market. So something where people could get it anywhere they needed to as fast as possible with highest ingredients as well, like the highest quality ingredients. So taking that, right, we needed to align around this vision and this challenge in order to get there, right, in order to be our option of being the Tuesday, Thursday standard option with more convenience and with um, more high quality ingredients, we needed to double acquisition. That was the business goal because we needed to stay in business, obviously. So now my team is set up to go figure out how do we do that. So product leaders, right? The job of a product leader is to provide the vision, the goals, and the guardrails, right? Leaders of companies provide the vision of the company and where they want to go. Then we break it down into what are the goals that we want to hit, right? And then we provide the guardrails so that we say, you know what, we need to explore this area, but we don't want to be this, right? And we don't want to be that, so let's explore this box and figure out how do we actually get there. So in larger companies, we deploy this through a strategy deployment framework that kind of looks like this. Um, we've got this vision, right? Same thing, where do we want to be in five to 10 years? What's the value for our customers? What's our position in the market? What's our business look like? We have our strategic intent, which was doubling that acquisition at this company. That's about what business challenges we have to achieve in order to get to our vision. And then we break them down into product goals, right? Product initiatives, what problems can we address to tackle the challenge from a product perspective, right? Only with product and software. There's a lot of ways to solve business challenges, but what can we do as a product team? And then options. What are the different ways that we can actually address this? How do we evaluate them? So what we do is we deploy this up and down the organization, and it's not something that gets set in a day, right? This is something that takes months to come up with, right? It's something that's continuous. It's something that we're always evolving, and we're trying to figure out how to get there. And what happens is if we do this well, if we set up a strategy really, really well and create a good strategy, that promotes alignment. And the biggest issue I have seen in all the companies I've come in to help is alignment, right? We have a lot of people on product teams who are saying, this is the most important thing I'm working on, or we look across the teams and we're saying, okay, they're working on you know, initiative A, this team is working on initiative B, this team is working on initiative C. And what they do is they peanut butter everything, right? They peanut butter their strategy where one person's working on one thing and then nothing gets produced, right? Because we're not making a big concerted effort towards things that are gonna move the needle. So by getting alignment around what's our most important things, right? And making sure everybody's working on it, 
you'll see more progress, and you'll see better things delivered out to your customer. So without that, though, if we do peanut butter strategy, right, what we see is teams going in motion, right? But we're not going anywhere. And you hear executives say, oh, our teams can't deliver, right? They need to go faster. They need to go faster. And it's usually not about velocity. It's usually about alignment. So to escape the build trap, we have to drive high alignment through a good strategy framework that allows teams to make decisions. And the thing about this, too, is that if you create a good strategy framework, you are now giving teams autonomy on how to hit goals, right? You can now drive autonomy throughout all of your teams and allow people to experiment because they're all going in the right direction. So the one thing, though, about strategy, right, is that you can't set it, like I said, in a one-hour or one-day meeting. Our product strategy has to emerge from experimentation and research and data, right? You have to figure out what's the right direction to go in. So the next step, really, is refining our process to support that strategy and figure out where we should go. So when I came into this meal kit delivery company, they had tons of ideas, tons and tons of ideas. Nobody lacks for ideas. Um, and I said, OK, what do you think is causing this issue? And they said, well, our photos are not enticing, right? We've got a picture of a steak on the website. Maybe vegetarians are getting scared. Like, that's why people are not signing up. Um, we should be offering sign-up gifts. The head of marketing really, really wanted to put chef's knives in the boxes as a free welcome gift. And I was really nervous about doing that because I thought people would stab themselves, um, <laughs> which they probably would have. But he was convinced. He was like, no, no, no. We offer them a knife, they're going to sign up, right? Um, we need to rebrand the sign-up funnel. They had a new creative director who did a massive rebrand of the site. And she's like, the sign-up funnel hasn't been rebranded. It doesn't look beautiful. That's it. That's why people are not signing up. And then also, some really good, valid ones. Like, maybe it's because they can't try it for free, right? If we gave free trials, they try it, they see if they like it, it's great. Or our price is too high. We were a very high price compared to competitors in the market. And it's because we had organic food and higher quality food. But the price was higher. So these are all good reasons, right? These are all good solutions. But we have absolutely no idea what the problem is. We don't know why people aren't signing up. So we're just guessing in the air. So when we're guessing, right, we're not really being strategic about where we want to go. So when we revisit this, right, and try to align around it, my team is looking at this and saying, OK, if we're going to double acquisition, what is standing in our way of doubling acquisition? Why are people not signing up? So we started breaking it down our sign-up funnel, right? And on our sign-up funnel, we went through, and we realized that people were getting in there, but they were falling off on one specific step. And coming from e-commerce, I'd expect it to be where you pay, right? Because people will balk when you pay. But it wasn't. It was when they started to enter their address. So they knew what the price was. They knew what the product was. They selected it. Now they're falling off when they enter their address. And I'm going, that's really, really weird. But we did the analysis, and we found that if we really target increasing conversion rate when people land in the funnel, we can get really close to our goal. We had tons of people coming to the website. They just weren't making it through. So our marketing efforts were perfect, right? They were doing really, really well. But people are falling off. So if you've ever, so we took this, and we revisited it, and we put it into our strategy framework. And we said that in order to reach our goal of doubling acquisition, we're first going to increase the conversion rate across all the platforms by a certain percentage by the end of Q2. So that became the goal that our team went after, right? So the team I was coaching, they said, that's it. This is what we concentrate on. Let's figure out how to actually hit it. So we went back to the beginning, and we started trying to figure out how do we learn more about our customers. So our first obstacle is we don't understand why people are leaving, right? No idea why people are leaving. And because they were coming to our site and not giving us any information before they left, Right? We didn't capture any of their emails or their phone numbers. We couldn't follow up with them. So how do we get this information? We're starting to rack our brains. We don't really know what's going on. And one day, our lead developer, Scott, he came up to me and he said, Melissa, I found this really cool tool. It's called Qualaroo. And what we could do is put a little bit of JavaScript on our site where people are falling off. And when they go to leave, it'll pop up and it'll say, what's stopping you from signing up today? And I said, that's cool. Like, I, I, like, one, this is awesome. I'm really excited about it. Maybe we don't put like an open text box. Maybe we do like a multiple choice, whatever. Just put it up there. So within one week, we had like 300 responses. 
And then within one month, we had thousands of responses. Like everybody was writing in this toolbox and telling us why they weren't signing up. And it had absolutely nothing to do with not getting a chef knife, right? It had everything to do with, I cannot find any information that I need on your website. So the biggest thing, 33% right, of the responses were, I can't find your food menu. What food do you serve, right? Like, do I even like it? And that was on the page, but it was buried, right? Um, what's in the box? How does this work? Do you give me salt? Do you give me milk? Do I have to buy eggs, right? Like, how does this thing work? I've never done a meal kit before. Some people said the price is too high, right? But it wasn't worded that way. In the open text box, right, it said, I don't understand why you cost more than your competitors. So now it's a value question, right? How, why? Why are you paying more for us if we're the same as everybody else? And then there was other reasons. But 33%, right, said, I can't find that food menu, which is basic, right, just things that we should do. So we looked back and we said, OK, now our obstacle is that people can't find the menu, right? How do we dig into why or how do we fix that? And if we went to our site, right, it was because the menu was hiding under this hamburger icon that was like up in this corner, right? And that was the only place that you could actually access the menu. And only 2% of people clicked on it. So nobody's finding the menu because we did a huge site redesign the year before. And that site redesign was all about simplicity, right? And they made it so simplistic that they took away all the information. So, so this little culprit is what's causing 33% of people not to sign up. So we did a test, right? We said we don't have a lot of pages on the site. It's just a long scroll. What can we do in just a week, right? Like one week. What can we do to expand that menu and see if that helps? We believe this is a navigation problem, right? Let's figure out how to tackle it. So we did this. We put menus up there because it was a separate page. We put FAQs and help because they were on Zendesk. And we said, let's put it up there. Had tons of arguments, right? The creative director is going, no, 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 we got to make all the pages. I'm like, no, just test this. Let's A-B test it and figure out what happens. Well, the two weeks we tested this in, conversion rate skyrocketed, right? It went out of the park because people could find the food. It was good food. It was a good offering. We were just not telling people what we actually had. So then we went back to the drawing board and figured out how do we take all that feedback from customers and put it into a site with better navigation. So we broke it out, we answered all of their questions, and they were able to double acquisition by doing that, by iterating through these versions of the website that actually solved the problems for users. So to escape the build trap, right, we need to use the right processes and the tools at the right time. Specking out that product plan, right, of all the content on the website was not going to get us anywhere because we would have put the wrong information there. We didn't know that they couldn't find the menu. By actually taking the time and understanding our users, right, and really focusing on experimentation, we were able to do the best things for our users. So we were able to really solve their problem and hit our goals. Now, there's so many tools out there. Right? There's so many tools, there's so many new fads, and everybody gets really excited about them. So we're all like, prototype all the things, right? I had um, a product owner at a company come in to me um, when I was coaching there. He said, I'm going to go build 22 prototypes. I was like, why? <laughs> why are you going to build 22 prototypes? And he's like, well, I'm going to show them to our users, and they're going to pick out each piece of the product they like, and then I'll make that one product. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is not what prototypes are for. I like your ambition, but let's calm down for a second, right? First, what problem are you solving? No idea. Go do user research, right? So we have to figure out how do we stop there. Another one, design sprint, right? Design sprints are great. But a lot of times, people use them to solve super complex, really, really, really large problems, right? Instead of trying to get them into a space that you can iterate around quickly. Design sprints are awesome for specific types of problems that you want to solve. So the thing that's about tools, right? They're useless unless you use them correctly. So being a product manager, right, is all about sensing, like, where am I? What do I have to learn? What am I trying to do here, right? And then responding to it so that you know what tools to actually use. So to do that, we use something called the product kata, right? And the product kata is about really stepping through experimentation to learn. And with that, we first understand the direction, right? Where's the company vision from our strategy? 
Then we analyze the current state. Where are we right now? So where are we compared to that vision? Then we break down what's the next goal to actually achieve it. So we set our strategy framework, and then we choose the right step of our process, right? Our right tool to use to experiment around actually getting to that goal. Once we hit it, we set the next goal, and we keep doing that until we reach everything. So the thing about the product kata, though, is it asks certain questions like we did at that meal kit delivery company. What's the obstacle standing in the way of reaching our goal? What did we learn from that, right? What experiment can we drive to actually learn? Then what do we learn? And then what's our next obstacle? And we keep doing that until we learn. So learning, at the end of the day, is what reduces uncertainty around what products we build. So that's really what we have to concentrate on as companies, right? How do we improve the rapid rate of learning about what our customers want and what's the right direction to go? And we have to actually notice that we don't know all the answers, right? Like, we don't know all the answers when we first start out. So that's why it's absolutely critical to have a cadence of discovery and delivery, right? It's not all about delivery, it's also about discovery. And how do we blend these two things together so that they can inform what direction we want to go into? And that, right, really gets down into how do we set up our organizations to succeed? So product organizations, right? Product organizations um, need to be set up in a certain way that really enables that strategy and really enables that process so that they can work together. And you have to build a culture around that. So when companies are focused more on velocity and adopting agile, and they, they say they're agile, but they only really care about velocity and story points and that everybody has their little job, right? They're not fundamentally agile because all they're worried about is how do we produce things faster, right? How do we shove out more features? How do we do all this? And Agile, right, if you've ever read the Agile Manifesto and you go to the second page, there is a second page if you didn't know that, um, the first principle on it, right, says our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. That is the first principle on the Agile Manifesto. So if you are in a company that claims that they're Agile or that they want to be Agile and you are not worried about the customer and you're not worried about satisfying them, you're doing it wrong. That is not agile, right? That is just scrum, right? That is just like going through the motions and not satisfying the customer. So the principles of the agile manifesto on that page really tell us what they meant, right? This is really what we mean by those things. So satisfying the customer is huge. So we have to create an organization, right, surrounding that. To escape the build trap, we have to create a product-led organization that has the policies and practices needed to navigate uncertainty, right? That's what we have to build. So I talk about these companies being product-led, right? What does that mean? What does it really mean to be product-led? Well, there's, let's talk about what not product-led is. <laughs> this is pretty common, right? So some are sales-led. Sales-led organizations are when the sales team kind of runs the show, right? And they're selling ahead of the roadmap and they're signing agreements for whatever they can sell without you really figuring out the strategy. So the product team becomes reactive, right? It's been like, oh, how do we satisfy this contract? Oh, let's go do this really fast. So sales-led organizations are a dangerous, way to, dangerous place to be in because you're not really being strategic. You're being more reactive and you're not really figuring out if the things that are in that contract are going to work for everybody. Another one is being visionary-led, right? Which is kind of what, what Apple did, right? It's all based on somebody's idea of the vision, right? And what happens is that person, if they go away, how do you replace them, right? Like, how do you harness innovation throughout the company so that you can keep sustainably doing this instead of having it come from one person? Another one's technology-led. Technology-led organizations are all about the cool tech. Right? It's like, this tech is really, really cool, so we're going to build all these things, and then we'll figure out how to sell it later. Technology-led organizations don't work either because it's hard to monetize them or market it. So we've got a lot of people working on building super cool tech, but it's not really doing anything for our users. So being product-led, what does that actually mean? Being a product-led organization is about ruthlessly focusing on solving customers' or users' problems to drive business value, right? It's about optimizing those two pieces. How do I maximize business value? How do I maximize customer value? And how do I figure out what products and services are the right things to do that strategically? They're oriented around outcomes instead of outputs, right? It's not about how many features we can ship. It's about what goals do we actually hit at the end of the day. 
It's experimental by nature, right? And we're driven by continuous improvement. So we experiment, we figure out what we should be building. We know that we're not really sure at the start of it, right? We know that we might be building the wrong thing or that we might need to revisit what we're building and we might have to kill some things because they're just not working in the market, right? But we're experimental, we try things, we try to figure out which way to go. And then it's also a place where leadership enables empowered decision making by, uh, throughout the levels, right? And they do that through a strategy framework. So leaders empower the teams to go out and figure out what's the right thing to build. And they set them on the right path, they put that direction, and then they let them go. So one key to being product-led, and a thing that's missing in a lot of organizations, is this role called the chief product officer. How many people have a chief product officer? Yes, I like that. Not, not as many hands as I want to see, but I like that a couple of people do. So the chief product officer role is pretty new, and it's something that I'm pretty passionate about. We've changed course at Products Labs, um, and we've been working with uh, Insight Venture Partners to develop a training ground for chief product officers. So we go in and we play interim product teams in growth stage companies. We consult on strategy and helping teams get up and going. And we train chief product officers to go into growth stage companies eventually after they leave us from a two-year program. So the chief product officer role, though, I found is absolutely key because you need somebody at that executive level who knows how to interface with the executives to set that strategy, to build these organizations, and then let that product org just go, right? Just find the right things. So this is a key moment. It's a key position that we all need in product um, organizations to really become product-led. And I think we're going to be seeing it a lot more. And I hope a bunch of you end up being chief product officers one day at these organizations. So if we look at escaping the build trap, right, how do we really figure out what we need? We need a process, right, that really helps us figure out how do we experiment? How do we get to the right answer? What is the right thing to build for our users? We need also an organization, right, that actually supports that. We need an organization that really thrives with the leadership, gives us a space to do it, and a strategy that they set up to do that, right? And then the, with the strategy, we can do the process to become experimental and figure out what we need. But at the end of the day, right, organization, strategy, process, it comes down to people, and it comes down to the product managers we have at our company. And it's important for us to really embrace what our role is as a product manager and fundamentally understand that it's about optimizing that value, about really finding out what's going to be valuable for our business and customers. So I encourage you to really look at what you do and think about it from that perspective. Because the build trap, right, is a really comfortable place to stay in, but it's only up to us to really figure out how do we get out of it. So thank you very much. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, this talk, I wrote a book. It took me two and a half years. I'm never doing it again. So <laughs> please go buy it. It's on Amazon now for pre-order. Kindle version will be out in a week. In two weeks, the book will be out um, on print version. Very excited. I sent it to the printer yesterday. Um, I teach, uh, if you want these slides, melissa at sendyourslides.com. Put in the subject productize. They'll all come to your email inbox. And I teach an online course at Product Institute on product management, and you take 15% off with productize. So thank you so much for listening to this, and I hope you have an excellent rest of the day.